Thank you very much. Um, I've called this my love-hate relationship with Healthwatch UK. I apologise about the dog in the background. I hope that will stop shortly. Um, but it's partly because I was always in two minds about joining when um, uh, it was, oh, I can't remember his name now, Dr uh, Thurston Bruin, who wrote the most brilliant article I'd recommend to everyone here called How Much Ethics Does It Take to Make a Good Doctor in the Lancet many, many years ago. And I was always thinking, oh, shall I join, shall I not join? I like all the people, is it effective? So this has gone on for 25 plus years. So uh, it is, this is my you know, personal journey and I hope all of you too will uh, understand why we should love Healthwatch. But I think the problem is the world uh, in which we live, not the, the organisations that are trying to make it better. So uh, with that as introduction, I've been a member for a very long time and a chair for I think the last um, two or three years. So the history, um, there's quite a few people from Healthwatch here, so I hope that they will uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but also really listen to your much younger your audience in Concilium, who've uh, got things to contribute uh, to us as well. Uh, it started as a few ideas with individuals, um, breast cancer surgeon Mike Baum, the great uh, journalist Nick Ross and various other people who you can see on this old cyclist styled invitation to the a meeting at a pub. Um, we still are drinking now even though it's on Zoom so while we relax and think about things and um, I think Caroline Richmond's on the line. Um, so there was an inaugural meeting a long time ago and then it turned into the campaign against health fraud. A lot of media coverage at the time, this was the uh, late 1980s, um, and uh, talking about quack, quackery, anything that wasn't tested properly, sometimes because it hadn't been able to be, was being condemned as quackery because of seeing people delaying treatment and dying because they were using uh, alternative therapies. I think that was the, the initial really distressing uh, starting point. Uh, quickly, we realised that it's never so good being negative as being positive, so it changed the name to Health Watch um, and talked about for being for fair testing, for science, for integrity. And since then, it's been a charity. It's got a small amount of money going in and out, uh, very little paid for, but uh, a, a few functions are paid for. Um, and uh, although we're accused of being in the a grip of pharma, it is entirely untrue. Uh, it is entirely due to donations and subscriptions. And we're still here 30 years later. So um, we must be doing something right. Um, and probably the reason that we're still here is because the problems haven't gone away. If anything, they're worse. So these are the three official um, objectives in the, in the Constitution and the aims. And as I said, it was originally concerned with unproven treatments, now promoting uh, evidence and integrity beyond just the medical sphere into the whole of healthcare and the healthcare economy. And uh, we are very exercised and irritated by poor quality evidence, poor quality publishing, poor quality peer review, poor quality all around. Uh, and that would be whether it's for the so-called complementary and alternative therapies or the research um, and some of the, you know, we've had some um, uh, tangles with uh, the uh, Human Research Authority about their inability to spot bad science, which is unethical, uh, or pharmaceutical products or devices. And we've also um, submitted to uh, a number of government uh, committees around uh, the screening programmes, which we think have got poor evidence and are, uh, behind them. And we've got a number of uh, good media contacts. So here's just a few of the people. Um, it's, we do not believe particularly in eminence, but we do like to have some eminent people on our headed notes paper, and we have had Nobel Prize winners, so we do, like everyone, you know, admire our friends. Um, here is our president, Nick Ross, the uh, man who talks a lot about evidence-based crime policy and why we're not getting evidence-based testing in schools and other parts of society. And here are our two latest patrons, uh, the lovely um, Sarah Wollaston, a GP turned MP who was fearless and changed her mind in the face of evidence, uh, which is maybe why she left the Tory party for, part, shortly before losing her seat. And uh, Sir Michael Rawlins, obviously you know, who is the uh, chairman of the National Institute of um, 
Health and Clinical Excellence, uh, set up 10 years after Healthwatch, not directly connected. So what is an organisation? It's made up of its people, um, and the people who do all the work are the 8 to 12 trustees with some co-opted members. Uh, we sometimes have observers who think about becoming trustees, so you're welcome to come and observe if you're excited by anything I say, and uh, also some students because uh, we don't want them to take any liability if there's any problems. Uh, we have a small membership, it's steady, small, enormously high quality, enormously uh, good people, but you know I've always been the I always describe myself as the youth wing of uh, Health Watch. We are aware that we're partly because retired people have time, partly because as you get older in medicine, you start seeing the problems and the wider problems. And you know, wisdom doesn't come with youth, although there are some very wise young people. Um, I think we have a wide influence through those individuals, through our activities, and we've moved into the 21st century with a website, we're on Twitter, we have a video channel, and uh, increasingly, and I'm hoping this is something Lisa will be able to help uh, me and us with, with other partnerships, uh, with other organisations. And here you can see small but steady membership and how in the last three years we've been growing in terms of our Twitter followers, our threads, our conversations internally and externally. We also have some formal funded activities. Um, there's the quarterly newsletter which is packed with great uh, great articles and news. Um, I'd strongly recommend that and we're going now to slightly more um, prompt online format but still in a sort of quarterly uh, paper form too. We've had an annual award since 1993 and this is uh, not anything you can apply for. It's not like your friends put your CV in for uh, you know an honour or a gong or you put your CV in to try and win something competitive. These are people that we in a discerning way see as the absolute champions, in, uh, mostly in the UK, um, who promote evidence and truth in healthcare. And I'll just show you the list in a minute. So you'll see um, how thrilled um, many of them are to find that, that they've been noticed because many of them feel in the wilderness sometimes as well. We've had an annual student prize competition where we invent some flawed protocols and ask uh, students to apply to uh, judge them in order and explain why. And uh, many of those prize winners have become members, uh, have had good careers in their own right. Um, and that funding has been by a number of sort of educational um, uh, uh, bodies. We've had a number of public debates. The last two were on the sugar tax and the Satchi bill. Um, and our last um, annual award winner, because they always give a public lecture, we managed to also video. So these are things that was um, Jennifer Rogers on the science of COVID or the statistics behind COVID. And they, you can see the Satchi Bill debate, which was excellent also on the YouTube channel. So here, I hope you can read the names and you will find you recognize um, them. I haven't got Faye Kirkland, uh, the journalist and uh, Jen Rogers, up there yet, or that rather I couldn't fit them on the, the screen, but you'll see from uh, there's a lot of mixtures of disciplines here, quite a lot of journalists that we really admire because they don't uh, cut and paste um, press releases, um, some great skeptical thinkers like Peter Scrabenak back in 1994, um, Bernard Dixon, we've just seen his obituary recently, um, an editor of um, uh, New Scientists who really got that into the public domain. Richard Smith, who is an editor, as well as um, uh, Fiona Godley, editors of the BMJ, because they championed independent um, leadership in medicine and pursuing truth. Peter Wilmshurst, before, he, um, uh, you know, he, before his terrible libel case. Brian Deere, the journalist who exposed Andrew Wakefield. Uh, David Colquhoun, who's with us. Um, so a lot of really great people who've done things like Simon Singh about libel laws since. So these are the people we've admired and we hope that um, they've you know, appreciated having the award and keep an eye on us. Um, the other sorts of things we do are exchange ideas, um, whether on Google groups or in our meetings or in the newsletter or on the website. We've uh, responded to consultations and are doing that even more, uh, even increasingly now, formally looking forward to them. Things like uh, um, some of the consultations for NICE that concern us, certainly the government select committees, and I think we were part of 
a group that were enabled um, the Science and Technology Committee to say that cancer screening should not belong to the cancer arm of the NHS and moved it to the screening arm because cancer doctors see cancer everywhere and screening is a very different thing. Nevertheless, some bad screening goes on. Uh, we give each other moral support, I suppose, and in, you know, in uh, Peter's case, a special whistleblowers fund was set up to help him um, through some of the harder times he was having. We have resources for journalists um, and um, we can put people in contact with one another. That's a job, obviously, that Sense About Science does a lot more, but we are very um, niched in the sort of medical field of science. Uh, we've done, had a number of publications and we um, uh, one of them was on teaching in the uh, UK medical schools on complementary and alternative medicine. Uh, Les Rose has been doing sterling work with sta trading standards as to why they are not policing the misleading uh, selling and advertising of uh, products that don't work. Um, and we've done some publications uh, regarding devices. Sometimes it feels that we're rather lonely in the evidence-based medicine or evidence-based health movement. And there are a lot of people we see writing the occasional letter in the BMJ about a new problem of um, uh, distorted evidence or pharma encouraged uh, evidence or new rather imaginary diseases uh, in all sorts of branches. And they may be the only person in their hospital or their ophthalmology department or their dental department thinking like this and thinking, is it me that's mad or is the world uh, having distorted truths? And uh, we have been described as the awkward squad. I'm not sure if that means we're effective or just annoying, um, but actually one has, can't be effective without being a little annoying. So here, for example, on the right, I'm showing you some of the briefing backgrounds um, we've done about things that often uh, are particularly annoying um, in the newspapers around um, nutrition, um, the statins, multivitamins. Um, we're thrilled that um, Sense About Science had for a while uh, celebrities noted at Christmas for their, you know, ad, their, their promotion of, um, well, goop and all those other sorts of things that we know about. But we've got some briefing papers here that. Uh, to, to help journalists. Um, we have a research fund that has um, given some funds for a number of projects. We've been particularly exercised by breast cancer and the AGEX trial. Um, it's lovely to have my co-authors Mitzi and Mandy here. Um, but this is uh, a really shocking, uh, shocking thing. It's the largest randomized controlled trial in history. It is bad science and bad ethics. Um, it was planning to have one million, then up to six, but luckily recently it stopped thanks to COVID at four million women being um, recruited in clusters, uh, given information that makes them think it's a standard NHS offer. They do not give any informed consent for being in a randomised controlled clinical trial. Um, and the fact that they don't get the right information, even in the standard offer between 50 and 70, is problematic. So we have still got to campaign further about these things um, so that women and anyone being offered screening is given truthful information and we don't actually trust the investigators to analyse this properly. So we have been, still got some work to do. Uh, health checks were con, never mind. Um, I've explained that we were thrilled that Cancer Screening UK has now moved on to the National Screening Committee um, and we've been uh, negotiating and writing uh, to the Charity Commission rather hopelessly with the Good Thinking Society uh, because they will not, they say they are toothless like many regulators claim, um, to, to deal with uh, charities that are making false claims about health and endangering the, the, the general public. Um, we also took part, uh, we had a great symposium two years ago um, where we were able to come up with a strategy and submit to the Cumberledge Inquiry or the Independent Medical Devices and Medicines and Medical Devices Safety Review um, and uh, talk to them about our demands about keeping patients safe. And there's a lot of work which will be going on in Parliament, hopefully, if Brexit and COVID and all the rest don't get in the way of ordinary life. Um, so we're going to keep our eyes on the, those changes. So I suppose what um, Lisa just said, speak for 10, 15 minutes and then get discussions going. 
Um, so what my reflections were as I was preparing this uh, talk were that the last 30, you know, 30 years ago, there was nothing um, in, in or virtually nothing, I suspect. It, there was a few things like the National Childbirth Trust, you know, in the 70s and 80s. So there was some patient and health activism going on. But actually, in the last 30 years, we've seen a huge proliferation of official bodies, uh, advocacy groups, uh, partner organizations. Um, you know, it wasn't, I think Cochrane wasn't set up until 1993. NICE was 1989. Um, 99. There was the Healthcare Commission and then the CQC as the regulators of the health service in the UK. The NHS set up its own patient um, organization using our name uh, despite our complaints. Maybe that's a coincidence. Maybe it was to get confuse people about us. There are more and more sort of subspecialty royal colleges and the, you know, the um, Cumberland's report claimed there was something like 126 regulators in the patient space, all of whom she um, and uh, Sarah Chandler, who was helping her on that project, condemned for losing the patient at the centre of their thinking. Um, and seeing they were looking at three terrible scandals about the Primodus um, pregnancy test, the prescribing of Valproate, a teratogen for decades after we've known it's teratogenic, and then the latest pelvic mesh scandal, um, which has left women uh, incontinent and in severe pain uh, and a, a very compromised uh, gynae urology uh, profession, uh, compromised by its links to the kit manufacturers. And, you know, making some very astute observations about how the damaged patients' voices, and particularly women's voices, are not heard. Complications come up well after uh, the enthusiasm. Post-marketing surveillance is no good, and there are all sorts of corruption in the system. So I, I'm very hopeful that the 2020 report, First Do No Harm, will lead to a GMC register of doctors' interests, even though the voluntary or the voluntary one uh, who pays this doctor hasn't got very far and hopefully will lead to a reform of the um, medicines health regulatory agency there's other as i was saying bodies and advocacy groups all those little initials there are to do with the friends of science in medicine a very similar group to us in australia sense about science very into the public discussion of science the good thinking society set up by simon singh that's been doing things about libel law and again working uh, against quackery all trials, uh, the restoring of uh, trials because we haven't got the data, the Center of Evidence-Based Medicine at Oxford, Transparimed, and now uh, the latest kid on the block, Concilium. So many people are still concerned about the same issues about data, evidence, quality, and its misuse, the application, um, uh, not in the, the interests of the welfare of citizens and uh, you know, supporting our human rights, but um, maybe distorted by status, power, money, etc. But it, it does feel as though sometimes I was thinking, oh dear, what is this organization I've belonged to all this time? It hasn't done anything. I thought, well, look at all these other people who've joined in and we're still seeing patients harmed, evidence manipulated, fraud abounding, fake news everywhere. So the problems haven't gone away. Maybe they're more obvious than they were. Maybe they're greater than they were. Maybe we're just more connected in. Um, and I suppose as a charity, an advocacy group, uh, an activist group, um, what are we? Just a group of people with a little bit of funding and common, common aims and ends. Um, how do we measure our effectiveness in this place as opposed to any other place? Um, we are small, we are volunteers, and we are looking to change our name in this year and some rebranding, um, but actually we've been evolving over the years nicely. And I'm really grateful to people who have ideas that, you know, if they join us, they can, they can take up with us and maybe we can do. But it's, you know, it is, it is, um, it's always a tension between um, uh, integrity, our own integrity, which is not taking money from anybody and um, effectiveness. So that's the talk. Thank you so much, Susan. So if you um, close the slides, stop sharing screen, then we'll see everyone. I would appreciate if you turn your cameras on. Um, 
Okay, I'll stop sharing. Where's that gone? Great. Um, I have a quick question and then we'll open it to the floor. So I think uh, when you were talking, I was thinking about where is Health Watch position and obviously Concilium for us as well as many of as other organizations. And it feels like uh, there is mainstream, which is media, uh, regular science, um, things that get on the front pages about vaccines that we hear on a daily basis, and then there are conspiracy theories. So two polars of stuff going on in the world, and they're extremely powerful. And we see it somewhere in between. We're very underfunded, uh, overlooked. Uh, the fight is really, really difficult. And um, it's logical because so few people are willing to think, are willing to question, are willing to not, you know, just turn the news and then call their, you know, aunt or parent or kid saying, oh my God, did you hear? And then other people who are so keen to fall for conspiracy theories, overly critical. Also, they think they're thinking, but are they thinking? So, how... I mean, I don't even know what question I have. I I, I can ask you. It's uh, like, why are we there? Why? Oh why well, I, so forgot to mention, <laughs> I forgot to mention, and I don't think we videoed. We had an absolutely fantastic symposium about um, the science of misinformation, um, uh, which was about why um, false information spreads further, faster, and deeper uh, than truth. Um, and it was it was fantastic educational um, about what it is that marketeers know and have known always ahead of the scientists and the statutory bodies, which is how to manipulate people to make them do what you want to do, which is to buy your product. So the marketeers um, are, are one set of things. The second thing is that, as you say, something to do with human nature, which is that the exotic and interesting and our trusted friend um, are more likely you know, are more likely to hit the, the like and retweet button or, or to tell your neighbor. It was always so that it was much more interesting, you know, that man bites dog than dog bites man. Um, and so that's one of the reasons things spread like that. Um, and it actually then leads you to a number of solutions because there's actually a psychological literature on why it is that it's no point Republicans arguing with Democrats about climate change. You need Republicans climate change concerned Republicans to argue with climate change not concerned Republicans, ditto Democrats with Democrats. You have to be open-minded to talk to someone that you trust or is like you. Oh, someone like me doesn't think like that. So now we engage. So how we stay at that place, um, being buffeted by these massive other forces, I don't know. We are very small and I think you have to always find your own niche and say, I can't affect the American election. I can't do anything about climate change, or I can do my little bit along with everyone else. And I could dedicate my life to that with a lot of people. But here am I with my knowledge and skills of science, uh, the healthcare enterprise, my own personal journey through illness to death, as we all will be. Um, so this matters in a, in, a, in a different kind of a way. And I think that's what keeps us together. Uh, but I, I do think it's tension between, you know, just um, finding out for me and my friend and my sister, and, you know, all doctors get rung up about, you know, what's the latest on this? And actually it's really nice to be able to say, well, I look it up on Cochrane. Um, so it, it's much easier to give medical advice about things you don't know, but to be discerning about that is hard. Does that answer your question? What was that the question? Um, I, I, I think it was more of an observation. I think my question is more uh, because of those two parlors, why are they so well funded, incredibly well funded? These are huge political agendas and actually questioning and looking for truth is so underfunded. It's so, so difficult and you cannot go either um, against the mainstream and yes, these people exist, but no matter how many organizations we find, 
they're mostly lone enthusiasts or small organizations no one ever heard about, you know? Yeah. Um, well, I take heart, I, mean, you, I think we should, this is a very good thing about partnership, we should talk to um, political uh, economists and the people who do understand how all these other things work. That's the first thing. The second thing I take heart from is that, as Margaret Mead said, no social movement started except with an individual with an idea. Um, everything starts with individuals. So um, I don't think we have to be utterly hopeless, um, but clearly people like power and that explains, uh, you know, domestic conflict inside the home as much as it explains the extraordinary funding for in elections or in, you know, the space race or the medical arms race or whatever. So. Um, I haven't got the answer to that. I think I, I should talk to politicians or we could ask Liddy who knows the answer. <laughs> no, I'm not saying uh, I know the answer, but um, we have also, yeah, of course, we are in the cancer field and there we are trying to really fight quackery, which is very prominent in that field. And uh, what we've seen is uh, quackery is really a very... Uh, nice business and there's a lot of money uh, gained there and i will give two examples that we have been putting extensive work in one is gc math i don't know if you've heard that from david noakes um so gc math is a macrophage activating factor it's an immunotherapy so to say for cancer and also for chronic fatigue syndrome or whatever and he was based on the Channel Islands, but the product was sold over internet, all over Europe. Uh, and there was a, an American Japanese professor who published on it, Yamamoto, Dr. Yamamoto. So, and we fight for three, four years, uh, retracting the papers because it was all fake and, and false. But yeah, cancer patients are desperate and it was really pseudoscience about uh, enforcing your immune system and so it's so difficult and what I found the most difficult was talking to the editors and convincing them to retract the papers where we could prove that it was based on false evidence and the, those were peer-reviewed papers so it's it's really a, a major fight I, <laughs> I would say yeah. and I've, and finally, yeah, he also had uh, established clinics in Switzerland. He has been on, uh, his business has been closed down by MHRA, I think last year or two years ago. And then he was on trial, but still he has thousands of followers who really want his product. And yeah, it's all about marketing, storytelling, pseudoscience. So yeah, it was quite an eye opener for us that fighting that, uh, yeah, for the large public, he's a he's a very clever storyteller, and yeah, how do you fight that? That's uh, difficult, yeah. especially in cancer. I feel because people are desperate, and another case that we have been working on also for two, three years, I don't know if you've heard about that one, it was a specialized clinic in Mexico for children with deep G, a special brain tumor, type of brain tumor, and people would go out there from all over the world. We had four Belgian patients, it costed a fortune. It were official doctors in Mexico, so to say using FDA approved uh, uh, products. So also there we, we, we collaborated with an organization in Australia and in, in the Netherlands all over to, and try to prove that it was completely yeah, fake and, and money driven. But yeah, and I'm really happy to hear about you, your organization because we felt quite, quite lonesome. No, no, no. Uh, um, it's fantastic to hear what you've been doing, but I think you, what happens is you get forged in the fire of sort of finding that doesn't make sense. And then you start and then you yeah, get the exactly. react, ab reaction and, and no reaction. Um, and your story is very familiar. Caroline here lent me a book about quackery and the history of quackery many years ago. And there is a whole set of standard patterns and standard behaviors 
but uh, it, it, it is a problem. It, you know, we do now have something called Retraction Watch. We do have the Committee on Publication. Yeah, we were in contact with them. Yeah, we have the Committee on Publication Ethics, but we have a, a, a very seriously flawed publication model. And we, it, it, it's, all, it's just like when you report incidents uh, that in, in hospitals to learn. Some people feel they are insulted. And the idea that we are not a self-correcting um, set of humans in, in these endeavors that puts things right is antithetical to science. And the, and the fact that people are so reluctant to withdraw because they see it's a slur rather than, oh, I made a mistake, thank you for pointing it out. Well, of course, they're, they're charlatans and frauds. Um, it's very, it is very, very depressing. The other thing I've seen in my field of obstetrics and gynecology is a, is it, which is, I think, parallels the desperation of sick and dying people, uh, is the desperation of infertile people. And the, the amount of quackery and abuse and misuse of funds for add-ons that have never been proven to work, some of them, like embryo biopsy, actually giving you a lower chance of pregnancy than if you didn't have it. So I think wherever, you've, wherever there are vulnerable patients, there's an opportunity to, to exploit that um, and to feel good in yourself that you really are an ethical person um, mm -hmm. fighting the conspiracy. You know, Andrew Wakefield lives with himself and sleeps at night, I don't know how, as do all these other people. Um, yeah, you are not alone. You are not alone. <laughs> well, and the input we get, because we have that free service, it's called My Cancer Navigator, where we give personalized information to patients on cancer treatments. And we see a lot of questions coming in because patients don't want, are afraid to ask their doctors. And so they're kind of we're very neutral. We won't uh, say, oh, this is crackery. No, we always say we're going to look for the evidence. And then we try to, to really have a dialogue and explain about what evidence is. And, and it's sometimes really, really difficult to come from that angle. But I think if we, and that's what we try to promote now on the European level, that there should be some kind of, yeah, I don't know, the responsibility of, of big foundations of, of cancer leaks, that they would set up that type of, of really personalized uh, information for, for patient, evidence-based information for patients. Yeah. yeah, well, we can't get to, I mean, the HFEA, for example, the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority, was only shamed by a panorama investigation, um, which I was thrilled to have a little part in, um, uh, showing the, you know, the, the terrible abuse of add-ons and a big paper done by Carl um, Hennigan in the BMJ. Uh, and of course, hundreds of them all wrote and said, but we've got no declarations of interest, which they then had to all uh, apologize for because they all did. And really we're very good guys. Um, and so then the regulator now has got a little traffic light system. It's not doing as good a job as it sounds that you are, but it is saying there's no evidence for any of them. But they don't stop them selling it. They don't name and shame the clinics because the, uh, the, some, of the, some of the worst clinics in the UK have, have uh, taken the BBC uh, to court and won, and they've taken the HFEA to court and won because they have so much money. Um, so it's, yep. it's very difficult. I mean, I think individuals are, you know, more irritating, probably like ants than institutions that uh, fight sometimes. Anyhow, anyway, we, mustn't, we mustn't despair. <laughs> no, and we will try to promote something now in the Europe's Beating Cancer Plan. We will ask Europe to, to put money in really increasing the level of health literacy because it's really a matter of education also, I think, yeah. to explain can I, can to I people you, what can, evidence is. Can I ask you a question, since you are so influential in the European cancer scene? Could I ask you why the uh, cancer profession will not tell the truth about screening and why we can't have, a, a this might be the opportunity to hear now, to say that every single screening must be associated with a fact box and an icon array similar to what we see with the wonderful um, Max Planck uh, Harding Institute of Risk because uh, there's the Winton Institute and the Harding uh, Risk Literacy and it would be very nice if the cancer world just said 
screening isn't very good, um, you can have it or not have it, but it should not be prioritised for headlines. Millions of people suffering because they're not getting their screening appointments in the middle of COVID. Well, that's because there are more important priorities. So can, can we do something? Do you think the cancer world accepts that screening isn't really that good? And it is an individual human rights choice to be told the full truth and nothing but the truth, not be sent manipulative leaflets like we get in the UK. Yeah, and I think now uh, what I see coming in the Europe's beating cancer plan and even in the uh, cancer mission, there's going to be a lot of emphasis on screening. Eh? If anything, it looks like it, it will be more and more promoted for yes, prevention, yes. medicine, and I think the money and power in there is enormous. So, Susan, everything is a game. Well, I know, but we've got to, you know, the people who are dealing with the patients at the end of the day, the people who are causing complications by doing more mastectomies because of breast screening, not less. Um, I think we've we've got to we've got to hold this up to them. You know, banning smoking in pubs saved more people from cancer from one government policy than any amount of screening can do. This is a con. The taxpayer is paying, individuals are paying, and, and the whole thing's a big con. But there you go. You know that. Why am I speaking to you? All of you probably know that anyway. So you, you might be interested to see um, CRUK has just issued a booklet about their change of emphasis from, from therapeutics to early diagnosis and encouraging a, an industry around um, early detection. Well, early, de early detection before you've even got it. I mean, you know, that, or early detection when you have got it, not by screening. Well, I'm not quite sure what the difference is between the two. I mean, it's screening. I mean, the whole, the whole idea, as you know, is that, you know, if you get there early, either the surgeon or the radiotherapist and maybe um, the use of, of drugs as well uh, can be more effective uh, if you're at an earlier stage. So I, I think that... They're but not pre-symptomatic. The, the evidence for the pre-symptomatic is much less no. good. So, yeah, <laughs> sorry to say, but I'm in a very difficult position because actually I had a breast tumor that was detected two years ago because of the screening and okay. it was really impalpable. And both my and me, myself, my oncologist, my surgeon, it was really imp impalpable. So yeah, and I, the fact that it was detected early before it was, and it was deep, so no other way to detect it. And of course, I was completely asymptomatic. And it was a HER2 positive uh, cancer with a key, a key 67 of 95%, so really fast growing. So yeah, I think uh, I consider myself lucky that because of the screening, I'm sitting here and working and uh, but, I went yeah, No, it's very difficult. Thing. Michael Baum always said, you can never tell someone that she hasn't got cancer. What you can say is that for every 15 women who are detected, it makes no difference the outcome to 14. We know that many yeah. people, but all 15 say, thank you, my life has been saved. Many of them, if it was fast growing, it would have been found pretty soon and it might have been saved by the wonderful treatments we have. And many um, will still go on and die despite the treatments that give them the gap. Like my own sister, I mean, I've got a very strong family, his family history of breast cancer, and I wouldn't have a mammogram if you paid me. But so we, we, we obviously feel these things different personally, and we do listen to our stories of our sisters, our friends, and what happened to me. Yeah. But the fact is, before you went for a mammogram, you probably were not shown the Harding Center icon array showing no impact on death and an increase in mastectomies. And one never knows of those 15, maybe one woman's life of the 15 was saved it might even be yours but somebody else maybe have died because of excess radiotherapy of a heart attack or a stroke and will never tell yeah. the story because she's the counterfactual and the, we see that in prostate screening you know one um so as i'm not arguing I, you know we don't we don't know we don't know um but the stories as you said are very powerful and um i think with screening that the 
we, we actually did a study in a, a, a publication in Nature Reviews Clinical Oncology um, a few years ago. And what it showed was that, for instance, for cervical cancer, where it's a pathogen HPV originating cancer, um, actually detecting those early can be actually quite hugely successful. Um, so in other words, you can't treat all cancers the same. I think breast, prostate and lung are very difficult to detect early. But there is some evidence that the slightly slower growing polyps, the colorectal cancers and the um, cervical cancers, on the other hand, screening potentially has had a be better sort of uh, effect on some of the, you know, um, mortality outcomes. Um, but the trouble is that that nuance isn't very well documented in the literature and it certainly isn't presented very well to the public. Um, and it's ironic because today, of course, is the second day of the European Cancer Summit, which is taking place 18th, 19th of November, as you very well, both of you, Lydia yeah, and Susan, there. know. And of course, the big headlines from that in the last month have been 87 potentially thousand uh, deaths or live years could have been saved through having, for example, better screening with regards to, you know, uh, pathogen or origin type cancers. So I do think there is a place for screening and I do think sometimes it has helped in some early detection. The trouble with cancer is determining the difference between a cancer that you, you would die with, not from, it yeah. sort of is so slow growing that it doesn't really have an impact on you in terms of your life and symptoms is almost difficult to distinguish from the ones that actually will cause the problem. And yeah. screening hasn't really helped a great deal. And we know about things like lead time bias and such like. So I do think you're right. The messaging on screening has to be clearer. And the fact that we don't have all the answers and we need to be more upfront with people. But I don't necessarily think that we should certainly abandon screening um, yeah, yeah, yeah. because I, I also think that would be a dangerous um, sort of message to send. Yeah. Um, I don't know what other people on the panel think. Or... No, I, I agree absolutely. I mean, there, there are some things like um, gammopathies in the over 60 year olds that can be followed. And it could well be, as, as you suggested, that many of those people will die of a heart attack anyway before they get myeloma. But, but some will develop myeloma, and the earlier that you see it, the better. And uh, having, you know, six monthly to uh, yearly screening for that is, is, is very good. And, and I think you can um, broaden that to, to other cancers. I think that the emphasis in the CRUC document reflects the view that um, the technology is also not being brilliant, and the technology is getting better. Um, the ethical questions remain, you're quite right, uh, and they're quite difficult. But if I was to be screened, well, I am screened. I've got a gammopathy. Uh, you know, I, I have my um, immunoglobulin screened every year. Uh, it doesn't worry me. I mean, I just know that um, with my age, I'm at risk. And I'd rather know than not know. Um, and I hope that, you know, if it develops, um, I won't be a false positive. That's always a problem, as you've said. Um, so so I, I think it is an important strategy, um, particularly when I think therapy um, is really on a plateau. I mean, you know, there are no therapies now uh, to look forward to that are, are going to give uh, really significant changes in survival in cancer. So what do we do? Well, I think, oh, sorry. So, no, you go first, please. I was just going to say, um, I'm an obstetrician, so we love screening. Screening the newborns for diseases that will last for 70 years that you can avoid, um, or by giving, you know, a pneumococcal vaccination for sickle cell or uh, changing the diet for female alanine. I mean, we are the poster child for screening. So please don't think I'm against screening per se. I just think that screening is, it, we don't have the right attitude to it, which is that it's not the best thing. The best thing is to have a disease that you can cure 100% or a disease you can prevent 100%. But screening inevitably is costly because it's huge numbers, inevitably causes anxiety, even if you're quietly, happily waiting and having your blood test every so often. Um, and it, it causes harms. So as 
with every single thing you apply, a policy or an individual pill or an individual operation, you've got to be able to tell the truth about the harms. And I think we all just don't want to see it and, and, and certainly don't want to experience it. So I think that and when it comes to cervical screening, it has a harm. It causes premature babies because of cone biopsy. My specialty in obstetrics, we saw that. Now we've got a vaccine, maybe we can stop screening. TB went away, we stopped um, doing chest x-rays back in the 1950s or whatever it was. So screening is always a temporary thing between a perfect prevention and a perfect treatment. And we should always be having a system for getting rid of it. I think that would be a better, that would be a sort of healthier approach to screening that we won't need it anymore when, you know. Um, and the, the, I think the, 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 um, the other con is that, you know, health is up to you as an individual. And I think COVID has shown more than anything how A, interconnected we are, and B, how our lives are foreshortened by social conditions and um, the ways we operate our societies that we could do, we could save a lot more lives. I, I can't bear the NHS rescuing program coming up with so many lives saved every year when they're, they're made up and they're marking their own homework. It's not right that people make their own claims and are never challenged. So I think we've got very bad systems. Okay, we've been concentrating on cancer and screening, but I think it's much, much wider um, in terms of what are the systems to generate new knowledge uh, while we're doing the wrong thing, for 50 years we've been doing fetal monitoring with cardiotocographs, which have no randomised control trial evidence to show they are beneficial, although a massive medical legal industry is based on them. Um, and all we've seen is harm to women go up and no impact on, uh, or probably no impact on the brain damaged babies, who we are probably making sicker by cord clamping them too early. So, but because we've spent 50 years believing in a thing we'd want to believe in and our jobs depend on, we then don't get on and do the right research. Now, you're right, maybe some things, there is no improvement for cancer, but there's certainly improvement for infections, there's certainly improvement for some of the disabilities, some of the you know, obesity, some of those other diseases, some of the chronic diseases. So I think there's a lot for scientists to get on with rather than trying to go for the marginal extras of the popular diseases that sell newspaper headlines. Thank you, Susan. So I'd like to give a word to Ellie and then to David. Okay. Um, thank you for your talk, Susan, and also thank you for the, the activism uh, over the last 30 years. It, it feels like a losing battle, so it's always good to know that there are good people who have not given up as yet. So I was just listening to what you said. It does seem to focus almost on the supply side. So, so there are all these quacks or how to fool people. But... Um, I was just wondering if we could think about the demand side, because there clearly is a demand. And um, I, I mean, it, it, for, uh, just, it's just from experience of working uh, in hospitals w with patients, and, and it's all these other treatments seem to offer something or, or, or touch some part of the healing process that allopathic medicine does not reach. I, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what it is until um, I, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about what it is that, that drives patients to demand this. And, and, and it's not education because I've seen it across the board, including for medical professionals uh, and very well-educated people. It's not desperation because it extends across three conditions where there's no need to be desperate. Uh, so what, is it, what, what do you feel drives the demand and what do you feel you we could do to address the demand because if you stop the demand you don't have to worry about the quacks and 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 and, and the remedies yeah well i it, there's very interesting richard smith gave a wonderful lecture i don't think it's been written up but he talked and a number of people have talked about the paradox that anxiety has gone up as lifespan and healthy lifespan has improved but our health anxieties are inversely proportionate to our health and there was another, um, I don't know if you know Tom Shakespeare, um, who gave uh, this year's the Quaker Swarthmore Lecture. He's um, very disabled and he talks about why qualies, I see you're from Nice, qualies uh, are, are, are misunderstood, well not misunderstood entirely, but that a lot of disabled people actually value their lives more than other people realise. 
he lost his ability to walk and now has to use a wheelchair. And he says, it's dreadful, but then you get over it. So there is something about, um, there's something about uh, why anxiety it drives everything. Uh, and obviously it drives products um, and maybe then we, we will catch it. It seems to be infectious, doesn't it? And there's been a, it's certainly in my field again, um, the level of anxiety during pregnancy has gone up year on year on year when it's been measured in a similar way. And it's almost as if, um, you know, the society is becoming toxic to pregnancy. We've, we've cured the problem of excess fertility. We haven't cured it, but we've got a, you know, my grandmother's time, the problem was excess fertility and high maternal mortality and morbidity. And now we've, we're, we're, we're contracepting women, or women are contracepting through their fertile years. Um, and uh, it's never been safer. And yet it's never been more dangerous to be a professional in the field because every, every fractured skull, I saw somebody's in a coroner's court, the thing about a fractured skull, I, you know, fractured skulls at cesareans and at forceps, both under supervision. Um, so it seems to me that there's um, the, the toxicity is something and the anxiety is, is, is much deeper. And it's been very interesting, hasn't it? While we've all been locked in, that we've, we've a lot of introspective, anxious people have got less worried because they said, oh, the world is coming to an end and we are all going to die. And some people feel sort of calmer about that and some people feel more worried. I wish I knew. What do you think is the answer to this? demand side and I, I, I don't know the answer but I feel what drives it is is a sense of control people come into the hospital and completely lose control after that they're told what to do and in a sense it gives them agency even if they're going and seeking and I'm, I'm not talking about um, cancer and stuff like that but, but you know you say asthma or something it, it makes them feel that they're doing something that they're taking take matters into their own hands and are driving and finding a treatment, which when they walk into a hospital, from then on, they they have no agency. They 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 you know you know they yeah. the doctor tells them what to do and they follow. And it's it's somehow as I think modern in modern days that doesn't somehow fit into yeah. what well, healing I think should illness, be. Illness takes away our sense of con I mean maybe our sense of control is false in the first place, and uh, our fear of loss of control is is bad. And we are all, we are all going to get we are all going to die, so that may explain also the what you know, rational people and non-religious people find a little strange is that people with deep senses of religion are much less anxious and they often have better outcomes um, because the control is somewhere else. But you know, if you can embrace loss of control, then maybe you can, uh, uh, which I think is the humility and the I don't know and uncertainty I that science brings then maybe you can cope with it better. yeah I mean I, I'll just say one thing and then I'll shut up is that I've actually read a, a, a paper which looked at religiosity a measure of religiosity and a measure of fear of death and they correlate people are, who are religious are more afraid of dying than oh. people who, who are less religious uh, that was one paper I don't know how you know, know but, uh, it, but it, it just struck me as um, interesting I think th this is really philosophical and sort of interesting conversation because earlier Susan said, you know, for example, with screening, actually it does cause harm and that's true. And then we talk about first do no harm. And I think that might, we might need to clarify a little bit between the difference of harm in the context of the Hippocratic Oath versus harm that cause, is caused through anxiety for a procedure or a test. I mean, any time you go to the doctor, even having a needle put in you just to take some blood, you could argue that's causing temporary harm to somebody because if they're frightened of needles, you know, or a test that's relatively straightforward that actually shows you haven't got cancer and you haven't got anything too, you know, concerning, uh, it still causes a transient period of anxiety and sort of feeling of, um, oh my God, I might have something really bad going on here. So I think the idea that all of healthcare and all, and all of medicine can be practiced without doing any harm, almost we have to revisit that notion because I, I think any, under, any intervention, whether it's a screening test or just the sheer act of turning up to the surgery and speaking to a medical professional um, could actually be harm inducing for a very small period of time. Yeah. But of course, the other thing about the demand side is that 30, 40 years ago, before technology, before the internet, before 
all this information became more accessible. I actually think that the patients were less informed, perhaps less knowledgeable. Now that dynamic of the sort of the doctor knows best, the doctor knows everything. Suddenly there's all this millions of bits of information out there. And so that dynamic has changed. And I actually think the demand side is partly because people are having a greater expectation. You know, we've got modern things, we've got modern technology, we've got clever things like apps. My phone, I can pick it up and do all these clever things, you know, more technology they say than put man on the moon. And yet here we are struggling to <laughs> detect cancer, say, from a, um, you know, sort of biopsy specimen or something like that. So again, it's an expectation, I think, issue that we've got, which has been magnified or sort of uh, catalyzed significantly as a result of modern media connectivity. Social media connectivity is a great thing on the one hand, but a bit like, for example, children now get trolled online. They've got all these terrible things that happen where they're bullied. You know, when you used to be at school and you went home, bullying would stop. Now you've got it 24 seven on your phone or whatever it might be. So we've got these kind of issues that we're contending with at societal, you know, at a societal level, at a global level. But just to come back to your last reflection slide, if I may, Susan, I mean, you talked to, coming back from an ed, sort of editor's hat, you said patients are still harmed, evidence is manipulated, fraud abounds. How do we measure all our effectiveness? Um, all of these things, I mean, they're quite pessimistic um, <laughs> points, but you're right. Um, so what is it that, the, you know, I think with a publishing world, in my own opinion, in the last 15, 20 years of being on an, as an editor on different journals, I also think that to some extent, we see the same narrative, the same voice, the same, even when you read research papers, they often have fairly similar introductions. They've become a little bit more, you know, marketed in a sense. The, even the language used in science for me is quite unsatisfactory. I don't think it has the freedom of expression that it used to have. I actually think we're having a stifled scientific conversation sometimes by just literally looking at the hundreds and thousands of paper out, papers out there, the sort of terminology that's used the sort of acceptance this as you quite rightly say retraction watch is out there and it's showing there's been you know it's detecting more fraud but there's a, still a sense of oh my god we can't be associated with retracting a paper because people will think badly about us just to give you a heads up because we obviously work with cope as well you know committee of publication ethics and the problems we encounter is that even when we have, for example, raised on the odd occasion when I was at Nature, instances of uh, scientific misconduct, which automatically requires us to potentially get in touch with the deans or the high up people at, in the departments and universities where we may have detected, say, fraudulent data if we've been made aware of it by another publisher or a, or a whistleblower. Believe it or not, even just trying to engage with those institutions and to try and get that process you know, through a certain dialogue, that can take a long time. And even editors and journal uh, sort of publication people have actually found that to be quite a, uh, a, not only a difficult water to sort of wade through, but have actually come up against certain resistance. There's a tendency sometimes for those organisations to sort of pretend they didn't get the email, you know, and when we contact them multiple times, it's like, oh, we'll, we'll get in touch with you if we do it, we'll do our own internal investigation. So although, and rightly so, sometimes the, you know, finger is pointed at the journal publications for not being transparent, for not taking sort of responsibility for retracting papers. I just wanted to make the point, which I do think there is more that publishers can do. Um, but when we have sometimes on the on case by case situation, try to do that. Actually, we've been met with resistance from the all institutes that we're trying to get in, you know, to get a resolution with. I don't know what your thoughts are on that and how we can come. How, why is it that we've got a science world where we have got patients still getting harm, evidence being manipulated? I mean, it's almost like you, you're saying that there isn't really much of a system in place that is properly reprimanding, if you like, bad scientific conduct and behaviour. I, I noticed Mandy had a hand up before me, um, but all I'd say is, I agree with every word you said, there's a difference between harming a well citizen yeah. and somebody with a symptom and secondly one of the things about screening or going frequently is that the stress goes up and then the relief goes down you get addicted to the good feeling mm -hmm. and uh, it's actually like substance misuse there's anything that's psychoactive 
uh, and takes you from feeling bad to feeling good will be dependence inducing in a, in a group of people. So that, that's another side. But I think Mandy had a hand up. Yeah, I was, it was uh, another thing on the um, um, screening. A couple of years ago, there was a paper published. I think they did a citizen's jury of older women and um, who looked at all the evidence for screening. And at the end, um, surprisingly, they actually said they wanted to continue being screened. And the comments that were coming out were um, along the lines of they just really appreciated that, that people were interested in them that, um, it, you know, it was almost like, like if you're being offered screening, you know, at our age, it was just nice that people were interested in, in offering us anything, you know, and, and it just seemed a very, very sad thing that, um, uh, you know, that you get to a certain age and, and you're just happy to be, uh, you know, it, and, and to be offered screening is a sign that the health system is still interested in you. Um, and so that was another, it, Ellie was talking about motivations for, um, you know, what's the pull factor for these things. And I think this is probably true of um, not just screening, but, um, um, you know, a lot of sort of unnecessary um, treatments. People are just glad to be offered something and, and to have the attention, um, which may not necessarily do them any good, but they're, they're you know, perhaps more looking for, for attention than, um, than a useful treatment. Thank you, Mandy. David, you had a question. Go ahead or comment. Yes, I, I was looking recently at my, my, the talk I gave when I got the award. It was 2011, I think. And it was all about how the web empowered us to beat quackery. And it was all, feels a little rueful now because since then it's come back with a vengeance. I mean, probably the only success I ever had was closing down some of the quackery courses in universities. One of them took a long time involving an information tribunal and so on. And I got to cross question the vice chancellor of the University of Central Lancashire, that was fun. But uh, apart from that, it, it, matters have probably got worse. I mean, it's partly populism. Um, but the, the main problem, it has always seemed to me, has been the regulators who simply just don't regulate things. They just don't do their job properly. The Charities Commission, as we know, is, is also doesn't do its job properly. It allows tax-exempt status to all sorts of ghastly organizations. And having actually been on one for a, a while till I got fired, the um, complementary and natural, what is it called, healthcare or something, it was, it was uh, set up at the behest of the Prince of Wales. And they were a ghastly load of pen pushers. They just didn't do anything useful. Certainly didn't censor anybody. Uh, uh, the... MHRA are impenetrable. You can complain, but they never tell you what they're doing. The trading standards are exceedingly reluctant to prosecute anybody. The only people who are any good are the Advertising Standards Authority. They're quite good at assessing things, but they don't do anything. They have no powers to do anything when they find somebody at fault. So it's a, it's, it is a little depressing. I mean, the populist phase will pass, I think, and we'll go on to a gradual improvement, return to a gradual improvement, but it certainly had a setback now. I don't suppose it's permanent. But um, Is there any evidence about regulation? And again, maybe we need to be talking to political economists. Are there countries where regulators do well? Or um, what is the evidence for successfully combating Fraud or misinformation. Is five, five or six or not? Not doesn't look like. Yeah. Does anyone know the answer to that? I don't know of any country where regulation works well. Then. <laughs> I think there is also a lot of fear in a sense that when people question something, we might know it's wrong, but no one knows what might be right. And that kind of leading, leaving people without 
the solution is even scarier and um, actually this was a very interesting dialogue which raises this issues i mean the 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 chasm between science and religion and uh i was always very interested in it i mean beaten up topic of course by decades but and centuries but it almost starts to seem that if you cannot deal with the right science the next best step is indeed religion <laughs> the other one rather than quakery homeopathy or anything else you can um sort of fall into and uh but but still i think this whole definition of what is right because even best science with time gets overwritten and um becomes old and wrong over time so it, it is such unsettling um state for any of our minds that i think best we can do is fight what is obviously wrong and keep in mind how unsettling it is by not offering the right and um but by, by not being able to say okay what do you suggest i do uh wait nothing and this is incomprehensible to human psyche and i think we're dealing here with powers which are beyond reason beyond logic and then um driven so much by emotion that it's frustration but what what can we do just keep our best uh, efforts and hope that we will be heard by those who are willing to hear or at least give it a chance john diamond's book was very interesting in this respect he he blamed part of the the popularity of quackery on regular medicine, which was continually hyping magic bullets and yeah, advances, when in fact medicine, even now, can't actually cure many things. It can hardly cure anything, actually. It can ameliorate some things. Indeed. But uh, it, it, I, I listened to quite a lot of conversations about chronic pain. The fact is, pain clinics can't do very much about pain, but they won't admit it. And then they, Mark Gozel comes along and appoints an acupuncturist to the committee and they start recommending acupuncture. But it, it's, I think it's just desperation. But it might help if medicine were a little more frank about its failures. If you tried, you no, know, if you tell, if you tell some one with an interest in pain that they can't do much about it, they get very cross. So I think it's true, actually. <laughs> Chronic, <coughs> Chronic pain is non-specific pain. All right, sounds like we have a lot of work to do. Lidi, go ahead. Let's yeah, maybe just to find what we try to do, we don't talk about what is right and what is wrong. We just try to explain <coughs> what the evidence is uh, and then explain the evidence and then we always say people have to decide for themselves if uh, we only offer the evidence and if there's hardly any evidence of course for some of the crackery or we explain okay uh, and then we stimulate the people that with and it's mostly regular doctors also who offer all kind of yeah, crackery solutions we, we always advise the people just ask what is the evidence, the hard evidence, how many patients have been saved by getting that therapy and so on and so on. And we look for data. So I don't think we, sh we don't want to be some kind of judge telling people what is right and what is wrong. We just say, okay, let's look together and then we explain the evidence and then we say, you have to decide for yourself. Mm. I think if we could get a standard, I mean, I, I would just want to go on and on about the Harding Center icon arrays. I do think that our job first and foremost as doctors is to provide explanations where they exist or prognostications where they exist um, and be able to say, you know, a thousand people like you, this is what will happen in the next five or 10 years. Most of these will go away. Some of you will be left with a chronic problem, a certain percentage will die. So you all, if we frame everything with the natural history first, this is if you do nothing. It makes doing nothing a positive choice because doing nothing is okay a lot of the time, depending on your values. So what's so nice about the icon arrays and the fact box is they start with the do nothing option and they frame things both ways. They don't sell you the positive. They say 98 out of 100 do this and two do that or two do this and 98 do that. 
So you frame it both ways, so you're not manipulating. And then with the little, with the little spots, because I like diagrams, you can actually see, oh, it'll make a difference, you know, not to everyone, but to me. And, and actually treats you like an adult. It makes you more informed. I'm sure your anxiety goes down for knowing what you don't know. Here's the, don't, here's the do nothing, and here's the do something. Um, and, you know, I, for example, think, you know, there's a very, we know there's an extraordinarily strong placebo effect in chronic pain, in premenstrual syndrome, in all sorts of issues. And you can say, well, you know, go and try a series of placebos. You know, you can buy them from, but, you know, don't ask me to call them something else. Um, and you may find it'll work for a little while because they do for a while and then they stop. You know, up to you to spend your money like that. But call them what they are and say, they don't, you know, this doesn't work any better than that. Um, but, it, you know, that's, that's different. But I just would like, I'd like to stand information. And I think if everyone got information like that, at a many healthcare points, particularly the screening, uh, because that must be a fully informed choice and manipulated because it will harm health. You can only feel worse because you were a healthy citizen before you went in and there was something else when you came out, whatever you know, you might have been. But I think whenever you get offered a, an antibiotic for a sore throat or a, uh, I don't know, any of these cancer treatments, this is how much, if we don't treat you, you will die of your particular cancer in so many years and if we do this is the improvement well thank you but i think if we've got standards of information that might help might not thank you susan mm -hmm. very good insights I'm, I'm afraid we're out of time and um very important topics we have to come back keep discussing bad science good science and what we can do about it thank you very much for joining have a good evening and next week we have a fascinating talk on access to medicines from uh, European perspectives. So all pan-European fight for um, depriving patients from the medicines they may need. Uh, so do join next week. Good to see Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.